I'm back in plenary session, virtual edition. I'm joined by Dr. Vlad Kogan. Professor Kogan is an associate professor of political science at The Ohio State University. He's a returning guest to this show. He's been here before, I think, in 2020. Vlad, it's great to see you again. Hey, it's great to be back. It's been a few years, has it been, since you've been on the show, at least. It has, and it's funny that we're still talking about the same stuff we talked about back then. That's true. We haven't made, uh, haven't made a lot of progress on some of these issues. Well, we have, but we'll talk about where we are. So your focus, of course, is education policy. And even more broadly than that, or maybe more specifically than that, it's the interface of politics and education. Do you mind reminding listeners, what is it you study, Vlad Kogan? Yeah, for sure. So um, we're interested, in, it's me and a group of people, we're interested in thinking about how schools are governed. Uh, and in the United States, we have primarily local control. So we have uh, thousands of local school boards that elect tens of thousands of local school board members to make these key policies. And so a lot of our work has been thinking about that interface and thinking about how the decisions that voters make on election day um, affect student learning in the classroom. But since we last talked, we kind of expanded that a little bit. Um, so with last you know, two years, we've actually been working with the Ohio Department of Education and helping them um, analyze the state assessment data to really get a handle on how COVID has impacted student learning in our state um, and also, you know, to track the recovery and think about what's working and what's not working. So at, at the time we talked, it was all theoretical, but now we actually have, I think, some concrete data and we know a lot more than we did back in 2020. That's good. And I think ultimately I will conclude by me asking you the eternal question of, in a perfect world, how would schools actually be controlled? Should it be at a local level or not? But let's start off with, first, we have to draw a distinction in the mind of the audience. There's what COVID did, and there's what we did in response to COVID-19. And I know there are people out there who get really irritated because I'm in this group if we keep saying COVID did this rather than human beings did this. And the idea there is that, of course, there was no single policy response that you had to do. There's a range of policy responses. And so maybe we'll talk about some of the differences between Sweden, Switzerland, United States. But we did one thing in this country among many things, which was school closure. It wasn't uniform. And by closure, we mean in-person closure. There were a different range of virtual options. And the uniformity was that it was vastly different in San Francisco than, let's say, you know, Lubbock, te Texas, for instance. What happened in Ohio? Um, what happened with uh, in your state, particularly where you're going to get the data from? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I, I would actually complicate your assembly even more okay, good. because we actually did, did two different things, right? In spring of 2020, everybody did the same thing in the United States. And I think Ohio is actually one of the first states that closed schools um, and then everyone else followed. So there's almost no variation in spring of 2020. Um, and then starting in fall of 2020, that's where you saw the tremendous variation. And I think it's important to separate those two because in some ways, you know, I think hindsight is always 2020, right? Right. Um, and I think the question we want to ask is what, what was reasonable at the time these decisions were made? And I think my contention is that the decision in spring of 2020, uh, the logic was very different. And we know, knew a lot less than we did by the fall of 2020, um, when I think we knew a lot more. And that's where you started to see some of that variation. But so Ohio, again, just like the rest of the country, uh, we, we closed all the schools um, in spring of 2020. Um, and when it came time to reopen, um, our governor did something interesting. So he closed all the schools, but he said, I'm not going to force you to reopen. I'm going to leave it to, um, to individual school districts to decide. And it turned out that uh, just like the rest of America, different places decided differently. So we had about 120 school districts that reopened and for 100% in person in fall of 2020 and never closed all year. We had about 67 districts, which were kind of the largest urban districts that mm -hmm. never reopened for full in-person instruction at all that year. Mm -hmm. Now, some of them brought students back for hybrid classes um, in, in the spring. I'll talk about that in a second. And then we have the other 400 that kind of vary, you know, that vary that some weeks they were open, some weeks they were not. And so there was considerable variation. So in some ways, Ohio is kind of like a microcosm for the rest of the country. And so I think even, even though it's one state, many of the dynamics we saw here uh, were quite similar. Now, I think what was interesting is, you know, to, to, to you know, to, to preview kind of what happened. Um, yeah. Uh, the schools that decided they weren't going to reopen, um, you know, it actually uh, turned out to be much harder to get them to reopen. And what our governor actually did was uh, when the COVID vaccines became available, he said, all right, I'm going to move teachers to the front of the line. But but each district has to sign a letter promising that once your teachers get vaccinated, you're going to restart some in-person instruction. Uh, and that was ultimately the push that got those 67 or so districts that uh, weren't open at all to, to eventually reopen, in most cases, still only hybrid. So they were doing in-person part-time, 
uh, or in person for some grades, not others. So that's the Ohio story. Wow. And I think you're right. It's a microcosm because that's pretty much what we saw across the country. One difference, of course, is not every state's governor put the pressure on the district. And so some districts were entirely negligent for even longer by staying closed. Um, the other question I have for you is uh, twofold, two questions. One is what factors were, or you want to talk about the big picture first and then get into the nitty gritty? Maybe we should talk about big picture. Sure. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. I was going to get into the weeds on this. I guess big picture, you know, big picture. What is the Ohio story? What did we see in terms of learning losses? What did we see in terms of non-learning losses? And how is that associated with being open or closed? And, and what is being open or closed associated with? What drove opening? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, let's start with that second question of sure. what, what drove opening. And so um, just <clears throat> like the rest of the country, um, you know, there's been a lot of papers looking at kind of cross-sectional variation. And there's a recent really nice, really carefully done paper by some economists that looked at Ohio. And basically what they found is that that initial decision uh, to reopen the fall, uh, the decision to be you know never open versus always open, the biggest single predictor was uh, partisanship. So areas that were more heavily uh, supportive of Donald Trump those those are the places that reopened and stayed opened. Uh, the places that never opened until the governor kind of put the gun to the head and said you have to do it. Those right. were the most heavily democratic areas. And then there was places in the middle that that reopened, but then kind of adjusted what they were doing. And I think the evidence is, suggests that those people in the middle really were, um, you know, to a certain extent responding to politics, but also to a certain extent responding to the conditions. So you know, when when um, student and teacher cases went up one week they were more likely to not reopen the following week. Now, we don't know if they were because, you know, they were looking at the data or if it was just a matter of staffing shortages when all the teachers are out. Um, but so there was that important dichotomy. But I think the, we had to separate the initial decision to reopen versus you know, the specific dynamics. Uh, it seems like they were somewhat different. But partisanship, as we knew before, was really one of the most important considerations and one of the biggest, best predictors of what happened. And that's tragic. I mean, I think that speaks to the fact that, and if you cited this, that the public opinion polling in July 2020, right around that famous week where Donald Trump said, I want schools reopened, shows a real light switch moment. You want to talk about that for a second? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you're talking about a paper I did uh, a few years ago, I guess a year ago for, for AI. And so um, so what was interesting is we had really good public opinion polling on this question in actually in May of 2020. And there was two polls that were done two weeks apart. Uh, and so in one poll, uh, there was almost no partisan divide on whether schools should be open. And two weeks later, we saw the emergence of a pretty massive partisan divide. And the question you have to ask is what happened during this two-week period? Like yeah. the, the, the pandemic didn't change. Well, um, that was the week that uh, that Fauci testified and got into kind of the little uh, verbal spat with, with Rand Paul, where, uh, where they were going back and forth about school reopening. And the next day, uh, President Trump was asked, and he said, do you think Fauci is right when he says school, school shouldn't reopen? And he gave this long, rambling, incoherent answer, but it basically said, yes, school should be open. Uh, and that got quite a bit of national attention, uh, got quite a bit of news attention. And literally the next week, the polling showed a big partisan divide, divide amongst voters. So it's a kind of the story of following the leader, right? When you have prominent national officials that weigh in, especially if they're officials as, as polarizing as Donald Trump, uh, public opinion seems to follow. You know, what always surprised me about that was that people in my line of work, academic medical doctors who are supposed to impartially weigh evidence and people in your line of work, policymakers, um, even we were succumbed to it. I mean, I saw my friends and colleagues just anchor onto this. And then the other point to make is Anthony Fauci now says he had nothing to do with closure. I think that's an absolute distortion of recent history. He did. He spoke fervently in favor of closure and he was critical of Ron DeSantis in the spring of 2020 when DeSantis reopened. Um, and I think then the last point to make here is that um, uh, it's not good. I mean, it's not good to base your policy on whatever Donald Trump wants. Let's do the opposite. That's not a sensible way to govern oneself. So talk a little bit about the overall impact. What were the overall impact on on the kids and, and learning outcomes? For sure, yeah. And so um, we, we've done now a series of four reports. So Ohio is kind of unusual in that actually students took their first tests in person in the fall of 2020 in third grade, because we have something called the third grade reading guarantee where students don't get promoted to fourth grade until they pass. And one consequence of that is they get multiple bites at the apple. They take the test multiple times. And so we knew early on that was actually going to be the first real data we could look at. And so we started in fall of 2020, and then we've again updated since then. But let me just give you the big summary. So um, overall, uh, in the first year, so we're talking about uh, the 2020-2021 school year, um, test scores were, were down considerably. 
um, they were down more in math than in ELA, so about twice twice as much um, uh, <clears throat> learning disruption. I know I, the phrase learning loss is controversial, so I'll just talk about learning disruption. Sure. Uh, we, know, we know that certain groups were hit harder. So African-American students, low-income students, um, and uh, students attending urban districts um, suffered much larger declines, particularly in English language arts. Um, in math, everybody kind of suffered across the board, which was actually a little bit unusual. I think most other states uh, saw bigger differences across students in math. Um, and so the other important piece is that, uh, of course, all of those characteristics that I said, you know, non-white, low-income, urban, those are also uh, tends to very strongly predicted with the type of district that you attend and the partisanship of that district. So those are also the districts that stayed closed the longest. And so when we broke down the data along those lines, districts that were mostly in person, districts that were kind of mixed, and districts that were mostly online, we saw very big gaps across those, particularly, again, in ELA, but also uh, to a certain extent in, in math. Now, one of the questions that people get, and I'm, I'm sure like, you've, you've heard this say, is, well, they say, well, how do you know it's the school closures? How do you know it wasn't something else that was causing the school closures, right? Like maybe there was more COVID in some areas than others. Um, and maybe it was, you know, kids that lost parents and loved ones. And it was the trauma uh, that, that affected their learning. And that also happened to predict whether the schools opened or not. So um, we actually looked at this pretty carefully in a couple of ways. So in our first report, uh, we actually tried to control for that. Uh, you know, we had a you know a statistical model where we included um, COVID uh, case rates, COVID hospitalizations, and deaths. And unlike mode of learning, those actually had absolutely no predictive power in explaining the uh, variation in the learning losses. Uh, now, again, that was measured at the county level, so maybe not not as kind of precise as we'd want. But we also had this really cool natural experiment. I know how. So I told you about the third grade students that take the test twice, and they don't take the first test right at the beginning of the year. It's more like right before winter break. And then they take it again in the spring. And so uh, we could kind of look at, you know, yeah, how much growth they made during the middle part of the year. And we could see, you know, what was the impact of mode of learning during that part of the year versus stuff that happened earlier in the fall, right. which again, if, if you think it's, uh, if you think it's losing loved ones, if it's think you think it's all the trauma with COVID, that should have lingering impacts, right? It shouldn't just be limited to that time period. And what we find is that, you know, mode of learning only matters during the period between the two tests. Uh, so it really suggests to us that it was, uh, you know, mostly the actual mode of learning, not the other things happening in those communities that could have been affecting the mode of learning and also independently affecting, um, uh, you know, whether or how, how well students were doing. I so see. that was the, you know, I've got. No, no. Okay. So you're, you're, you're building the case and the case is this, that the initial decision in the fall of 2020 to reopen is largely falling the biggest explanatory variable is partisanship of the district whereas left-leaning urban enclaves and right-leaning trump voting areas trump voting period people they want to open urban people don't the urban districts were also the districts that have the most minority students um the most students under in poverty um and those students actually had the greatest learning losses um and then you want to use this natural experiment to argue that it is not COVID related factors. I mean, one way to argue that is, as you show in a multivariable model that has no explanatory power, that term and all the term it's on the openings. But then the other way to do it is in this period of time, you're looking at districts that um, uh, uh, you're looking at just the growth over time. And it has everything to do correlating with the method of learning and not with COVID cases. Uh, it, it, yes, exactly. And, and there's a kind of a very strong dose response relationship. So the more weeks of remote learning you had, uh, the bigger impact I had, but only during this time period between the two tests. And then the one mode of learning point. in I the see. months prior had no effect at all. I see. Yeah. Oh, so you're really building the case for mode of learning and its dose response. How do you deal with two things that I've always wondered about? Yeah. One, how do you deal with the problem of uh, the kid that is just totally lost to follow up? We don't even know what happened to them. Okay. And then how do you deal with the problem of they were in person, but there were just so many quarantines. They were basically out, yeah, out home. Yeah, that is a great question. So let me uh, let me take uh, take the latter one first. So you're absolutely. So what we have is, I guess, what you would call an intent to treat effect, right? We we are looking at the effect of what's being offered to you, not what you're actually doing. And so to the extent, and we know this, this is true that not, not all parents felt comfortable sending their kids back. So this is probably um, kind of a downward biased estimate, right? This I is see. probably a lower bound of the effect. Um, so to your, to your previous point, this is actually really important in, in 2021 because uh, because a lot of the federal testing requirements were relaxed. Usually the federal government is very strict in ensuring that all students are tested, um, but that wasn't the case in 2021. So the participation rates were down to about 90%. And also we know many students left public schools, right? They went to uh, private schools, which don't take tests. 
they were homeschooled. And so that creates not only, you know, are we missing students, but also the compositional change, right? We might expect if it's the wealthy students leaving, that would, you know, kind of uh, mechanically change the average yeah. test scores. So we counter this in, in two ways. So one, um, we actually, for each student, we observe their achievement prior to the pandemic. So we can directly, you know, control for how high achieving they were and address this, uh, this compositional change directly and model it directly. So that's point one. To your other point about what do we do with missing students? So we um, we do uh, what's basically imputation. So we observe the missing students. We match them to their peers in the same school district that look the same based on observable characteristics and crucially also based on their prior achievement, right? So we observe their pre-pandemic achievement. And then we basically impute the test score that we think we, they would have gotten if they had taken the test. Again, yeah, it's not 100% foolproof, uh, but we show actually it does matter that when you don't do the imputation, the, yes, the estimates of learning losses you get are actually smaller than when you make these corrections. So uh, people that are using just kind of the raw data are probably, again, getting getting a lower bound for some of the effects that we're talking about. Wow. And they both are work to be lower bound. Yeah, you're, you make an excellent point. So it's an intention to treat effect, which means that this is uh, this is the real effect of being in person is likely to be even bigger than what they saw. Imagine in person without quarantine policies. Likely they would have had even greater gains. Fair to say? Um, I, think, I think I think that's exactly true. And I think the other point I would mention is uh, there's probably some heterogeneity. And so there's a really nice paper by um, some, some economists that use not state testing data, but they use private diagnostic data. Uh, and many school districts in the country, um, in addition to the state tests, they have students take these private diagnostics three times a year just so they can kind of guide their instruction. And there's two big companies. One is called... Um, um, map one is called iReady, but they do the same thing. Uh, and what they show there is is the same kind of finding that uh, over the course of the year, the more students were exposed to virtual learning, the less they learned. But critically, uh, it, that was an interaction with the um, demographics of the students. So it was poor students for whom each week of virtual learning had a bigger impact uh, versus students who were not poor. There was an impact, but it was a much more modest slope. Uh, and, and I think it makes sense, right? That uh, we know family resources are probably an important. Uh, uh, part of the story of how well parents can compensate. But but let me just add, so this yes. was this was the first year, right? So we did this again just last year, for spring of 2022. And uh, one of the questions we asked is, all right, well, that was the first, you know, the first wave, you know, a lot of things happened. Last year, most of the schools reopened or tried to. Uh, now there were still some challenges we can discuss with transportation and substitute teaching. Um, and of course, an Omicron hit and, and we know that uh, that created staffing challenges. Mm -hmm. And so what we wanted to ask is, are kids catching up? Um, and the answer we got was kind of mixed, that in English language arts in Ohio, we actually saw pretty significant catch up. So students closed about a third of the initial gap of the COVID gap, which means two thirds are left. I think what's really, um, well, two things are really, I think, concerning and disturbing. In math, we saw basically no improvement over the past year. Mm. And there was also some differences across grades. And I guess the, for me, the most concerning thing is the oldest students, and I'm talking about eighth grade, ninth grade, and 10th grade, um, it saw the most, the least amount of improvement. And why that's important is those are the high school students now, right? So the 10th graders last year are in 11th grade. They got two years left uh, and they're, they're way behind. And I think, again, unfortunately, much of the focus has been on the younger kids because that's often for whom we have the best data. But the high school students, I think, is the most urgent policy problem because, again, they're going to be gone. We don't have 10 years to make up those learning losses. We have, for the, for the oldest kids, you know, like less, less than two years. Um, what about somebody listening and they say that this is all academic and esoteric? You don't need to know that much math. What's your response to like? What are the? Why should these scores even matter to us? Who cares? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, that's, it's a good question. I would say, you know, there, there's been a lot of work, uh, you know, linking um, linking uh, cognitive skills uh, generally, uh, and tests are you know one metric of that. Uh, they are pretty predictive of of longer term. Um, success. So they're predictive of labor market participation. They're predictive of how much money you earn. They're predictive of things like teenage pregnancy, of uh, criminal justice involvement. Now, those are all correlated. Right? So, uh, you know, I think we have to be careful to say that changing through some exogenous mechanism, those variables will, will have the same impact. But I think there's been very careful work done by economists that does suggest there's a causal effect. Um, and certainly, you know, uh, is, you know, these are these are pretty basic skills, right? And in, in context of math, right? Uh, you know, you need math for all sorts of things. Um, you need math for, to, to, to um, balance your books, to balance your finances. But also think about what a lot of these kids are going to be doing, right? And this is this is an argument I, I made I had at our own institution when we were talking at the university level. Like some of these kids are going to go on to be doctors. Some of these kids are going to go on to be building bridges, um, right? And so those are skills where um, math is actually really important, right? And I don't know, uh, you know, in the abstract, we talk about test scores and what they measure. 
but I suspect somebody is not going to be excited about driving on a bridge that was designed by an engineer who's missing uh, a year of math uh, than previous engineers, right? So I do think there are downstream consequences for the individuals. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's downstream consequences for all of us through the interactions we have. And of course, there's downstream consequences for our economy, right? Um, and certainly, again, and particularly in the current um, technological context and, the, and, and you know, debates about some of these global issues, right? Uh, that's actually important. It's really important to our uh, economy. It's important to our national security, uh, et cetera. And I, I guess the last thing I'll say is, you know, uh, the best research we have about what predicts long-term success, it turns out that math scores are actually more predictive of reading scores. So while, you know, we can debate, you know, whether you need to know calculus uh, and whether, you know, trigonometry uh, is, is that useful, uh, the underlying skills that learning the stuff um, helps students build does seem like it's really important for a broader success in, in the real world. That's my read of the literature, at least. I completely agree with you. My read is that these are not just skills that are confined to the textbook or classroom. These are skills that have impact apparently uh, and, you know, rather astonishingly on all domains of life from how well you get along with other people to how you attain at work and then even longevity. I wonder if you might talk a little bit about do the does education predict political valence? By not getting certain attainment of math, am I more or less likely to join one political party, or has that not been carefully probed? Gosh, yeah, you know, that is a good question. So, so there's been um, quite a bit of work. Um, I, again, I think getting causality is very tricky. Sure. Um, uh, so, I think there's been a couple of very carefully done studies on um, the uh, amount of education, educational attainment, on particular and economic attitudes and on attitudes towards redistribution. Um, and, but I don't remember what they found. I, I, so, so there is some work. So, so it is predictive, at least for those attitudes. Um, but, uh, you know, what, what the actual aggregate impact, I think, you know, it's hard to know. Uh, but certainly, you know, I think when we think about critical thinking, right, a lot of people right. are saying democracy is dying, right? There's, uh, you know, there's uh, fake news, uh, right. you know, s sorting out good news versus bad news, useful information versus not useful information. That requires a certain amount of cognitive skills, right? Uh, and it's hard to believe that uh, reading and math skills and logic that you learn is not on the margin helpful helpful for those kinds of uh, you know citizenship skills. I mean, it, that's a great example where I think that um, there's obviously fake news and and things that are totally incorrect that anyone with an ounce of uh, critical thinking can see through. And then there are people who claim to be the police for fake news who they themselves are subject to innumerable cognitive fallacies and errors, uh, but they're self-righteous about it, and they don't see through that. And yeah, obviously, I think the solution is more education, not less. But so I think you've laid it out very nicely. Um, now, the one thing I'll ask is, do you have, have you seen direct impacts of school closure on non-test outcomes yet, uh, or are those still pending? Yeah, that's a great question. So that, that's why I wanted to go next. So I think... Um, you know, the reason why we look at test scores is because that's the data we have, right? right? And I think it's unfortunately very hard to have uh, good data. But in fact, when we're thinking about long-term success, um, all the research tells us non-cognitive skills. So things like time management, uh, things like work ethic, things like uh, meeting deadlines, right? It's probably more important. And I think, unfortunately, it's really hard to measure. Um, I think, it, it, and, and certainly it's not something we measure every year in the way we do a test. I will say there's one really, really concerning, I think, warning. Um, and that is, uh, is, that is um, chronic absenteeism. So we saw during the pandemic, chronic absenteeism, uh, not just in Ohio, but nationally just explode. And then last year, it actually got worse, uh, which is surprising because schools reopened. Now there's a lot of debate about how much of that is actual absenteeism and how much of that was just you know uh, quarantines. Um, but but I, I think it's, it's really important, uh, important and I think it's really, really concerning. Uh, because, you know, I, habits, once they form, are very, very hard to undo, right? And I think one of the things that we saw during the pandemic, especially for older students, and I guess let me back up. I think in many places that that kind of reopened half-heartedly, they made a gamble. They said, we're going to reopen with the younger students because, A, uh, they're too young to be on Zoom. So, it's, you know, they don't have those skills. Um, and, B, they can't be left alone. But the older students said, okay, they can handle it. They can handle um, online learning, uh, and they could be left alone. And so many communities, like the my district, that's the decision that we made, right? We prioritized in-person learning for younger students. I think we'll, we're now living with the consequences of that decision because I think that led older students to develop some really, really bad habits, right? Particularly if you're an online um, asynchronous learning, mm -hmm. you can stay up until 2 a.m., you sleep in until until noon, uh, and then you know you do, work, do your work whenever you, you want to do it. But then the, when schools reopen, those right, those habits are there, and I think it's very, very hard to undo. So I, I worry. Um, 
that, that that chronic absenteeism we're seeing is partly kind of uh, you know the stickiness of some of those habits. And, and one thing we have seen is, is uh, chronic absenteeism increase much more for older students than for younger students. Um, and I think you know once you once you lose those students, lose those students, it's so hard. I think it's so hard to get them back in the system. And you know who knows what they're doing when they're not at school, right? Um, and, and the problems that, that that's going to cause for for the communities that they live in. That's really well put. And I want to get into this new data. Um, and I think that's really important that uh, that I guess it was good to focus on the young kids, but we may have neglected the older kids. And um, the other point I want to make is that sometimes I see people show analyses where they say, actually, this analysis shows that school closure was correlated with COVID-19 spread. And I took a look at some of these claims. And in my mind, if I were as a researcher was trying to do it, I would say that the way I would do the data analysis would be to have some metric of week to week cases and say that when cases start to go up, that's when I'm going to have a school closure and look for that correlation. But this, this, uh, okay. So in other words, like, is it responsive to what the pandemic is doing? And like, let's close if the cases are rising and let's open if the cases are dropping. But that's not the way these analyses were run. They take a single time point over a semester and they ask, is there a correlation between this one time point and like whether or not it was open or closed the whole semester? And in my mind, even if you were to prove that, it doesn't prove that it is, quote, a logical policy. It's brain dead if we're two months away from when it was surging and we're still closed. You know, I mean, you have to be responsive in real time. So I guess conceptually, I disagree with some of these analyses that aren't even taking it into account that the pandemic has a week to week, you know, uh, dynamic to it. Yeah, that's a great point. So I will say, I think some analyses have been better done than others. Okay. And so the Ohio paper that I mentioned by those economists, they actually do look at week to week change in case rates and the week to week change in modes of learning. Um, but I think one of the interesting things they, they note is over time that predictive power decreases. So initially it does suggest that maybe districts were overreacting to the changes. And, and later on, uh, particularly certainly after the vaccines were rolled out to teachers, uh, they became much less responsive. In the second half of the year, they basically didn't open or close in response to what was happening at all. Um, so, so there is kind of this also learning component, right? That you don't really know how much to respond. Um, and, and over time, they seem to kind of calibrate their their um, reactions somewhat um, to, the, to the conditions. That's well put. Let's get into the National Assessment of Education Progress. Uh, you, you, some news headlines are calling it devastating, unprecedented, and catastrophic. So what are what is this test, and and what are the results, and what does it mean? Yeah, great question. So so this is a, ta a test that the federal government gives, um, and it has a couple of interesting features. So it is taken by not taken by everybody like the state test. It's taken by samples, so about fifteen hundred to five thousand students per state, um, and it has been the same uh, for decades. So we can go back at least to the nineteen nineties. Some versions of it go back for earlier. So it puts. Um, student learning on the same common scale so we can track students over time. And unlike the state tests, uh, which have some you know things attached to them, which we, we could worry, maybe there's some gaming, maybe there's some teaching to the test. This is zero stakes, right? So there's really no incentive to teach you the test, which should um, give us co some comfort that this is measuring something real rather than test prep. I see. So yeah, so what do, what do we learn? So um, I think very consistent with everything else we, we talked about, uh, big drops. So in math, uh, it was the largest drop ever recorded on NAEP, ever recorded. Uh, so students are back at 2,000 levels. Um, in reading, um, uh, scores dropped to the lowest level ever. Uh, so back to 1990s levels. Um, and so, you know, I, I've seen a couple of weird commentaries. People say, oh, it's not so bad. You know, like, you know, 1990s wasn't so bad. But I think there's two important points. One is like, you know, we have to fight tooth and nail and spend billions just to get to get them up over that last 30 years. And then second, you know, by that metric, um, like COVID wasn't so bad because life expectancy kind of dipped, but it's still, you know, even with COVID, still above right. 99 levels. Right? Above so 90 levels, you, right. Yeah, right. so if you use that metric for, for yeah. test scores, then you got to use it for everything else. So yeah. I think, I mean, that's kind of a crazy interpretation. But so that's that's the bottom line, that like scores dropped pretty dramatically. They dropped about twice as much in math as in ELA. Um, uh, and they dropped in general everywhere, but there's some variation. This is where a lot of the debate is. Catholic schools did pretty well. Um, and uh, the Department of Defense schools, which it runs on military bases, did particularly well. They're the only kind of school that showed any growth during this period. Now, one more caveat, one more interpretive point, I think. So these tests are given, um, I think once every two years, they were delayed by the pandemic. So we're really comparing change between 2019 and 2022. And so that means we're, we're taking into account the learning losses from the first year of the pandemic, but also, as I mentioned, like any recovery between 21 and 22. So this is not the full COVID impact, right? This is the net effect of the initial losses plus any makeup growth that we've had since then. Um, and so I think that's really important. Can I make one more 
possibility and see what you think. Is it possible that the real results are even worse than this? Because the students who are chronically absent or missing is higher now than before. And you're sampling naturally among people who show up to school. Uh, if you were to really sample even the ones that are not showing, thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great point. And actually, I looked at this. Um, they released pretty good documentation. And we do see that participation rates on the test. So what they do is they sample individual yes, schools. I see. And yeah. then they report how many students at these schools actually took the test. And before the pandemic in 2019, it was about 93, 95%. And for this year, it was down to like 89, 90%. So we know uh. that... That, that the participation rates went down. And I think your intuition is exactly right. By the students who didn't take the test are gonna be all, for the most part, students on the lower end of the spectrum. So by not observing those students, you're right that we probably have an, uh, an optimistic take. Um, and again, some of our analysis in Ohio showed exactly that point. That's, uh, well, I'm glad you looked into that. Okay, now um, you make a note here that Catholic schools, there's something very interesting there. Yeah, so Catholic schools, again, depending on the grade, either they didn't show uh, any losses or or, to the, or they showed some modest losses. Um, again, you know, I think we have to be careful because there was a, uh, a big exodus to Catholic schools. Um, and so actually Catholic school enrollment was going down before the pandemic and, and during the pandemic it went back up. So, you know, I, I think with all of this, you know, the NAEP, NAEP tests are great uh, for tracking kind of descriptively what's going on, but always we have to worry about composition, right? Are the students that were being tested, are they different than the students that were tested in 2019. And so it's possible that Catholic schools uh, enrolled more higher achieving students who were fleeing the public schools and that inflated their tests. Uh, I think the other area where this is a big concern, and this has gotten some headlines, uh, there's one student subgroup, one group that actually saw gains compared to everybody else and people are kind of scratching their heads. And that's people who are uh, students who are English learners, who are not native English speakers. And there's a lot of speculation about, you know, why is it? Is it because they had access to services? But it could also be a compositional thing, right? We know during COVID, immigration basically stopped. And so the English learners ah. in 2022 will probably have been in the country longer than in 2019. And also, um, there are some rules about when you stop being an English learner, you get reclassified. And by those reclassification processes were affected. So we probably have students who are not really English learners anymore, who would have been reclassified, but are still included in 2022. Oh, so I think cool. there, there are these important compositional things that we always have to keep in mind with this kind of data. That's a really good point. Very interesting point. I hadn't thought about that. Um, DOD schools, the Department of Defense schools, what do they see? Yeah, they they are the only school that actually saw growth, consistent growth in the in the in the um, subject that were tested. Uh, and it's really interesting because many of them did close. Uh, so so it's not like they had more in person learning, but clearly, uh, you know, they were doing something different. Uh, and so you know, I was talking about this just the other week, and there was somebody in the audience, and they raised their hand. They said, "I know what they did differently. Yes, they closed, but when they reopened." They just went through the summer. They extended the school year. They didn't stop like everybody else. They they adjusted to the to the conditions, and I, obviously they kind of have a um, you know uh, you know their the, the audience doesn't leave right. The students don't leave for the summer because their parents work in the military bases, so they have the I think more um, flexibility to do that kind of stuff. But I think it is uh, a really interesting finding, right? That the Department of Defense, even though they they also closed in many places, uh, seem to have gotten back on track much more quickly than everybody else. Do we have any snapshot or window into private schools? Um, uh, yes. Uh, so, um, uh, the, you know, uh, I believe, I believe NAEP, uh, only includes the Catholic schools. I believe, I don't know that they have, um, other kinds of private schools. Uh, but we, we, so I think Catholic school data is the best that we have for, for, uh, private schools. Um, but again, I could be, could be wrong about that. You make a note here that California in particular was an outlier. Um, what do you mean by that? Yeah. So, well, so, so there was, you know, when, when the NAEP scores came out last week, um, the big headline finding is like, wow, like things are bad. But the second finding is, oh, look, like it's actually bad everywhere. And California, which had some of the longest school closures on average, um, didn't look that much worse than Texas or Florida, which which really rushed to reopen. So maybe this narrative about uh, virtual learning, you know, be, being bad is, is overblown. Um, and California really stood out because they their declines were were less, um, you know, were less shocking given given the length of time that they were closed. Now I think that you know there, there's one you know two things to think about it. again. These are samples, uh, and, and the way the sampling is done, I don't think we actually know whether the subset, small subset of schools who were included in California, um, how much in-person learning they had. I don't I think uh, there's really any reason to believe that these samples are representative at the state level. I see. Um, so one is there's 2,000 schools nation nationally sampled, so there may be a few hundred in California. No, there's 2,000 students sampled in California from, oh, from a see. couple from yeah from a couple hundred schools. And okay. again, there's millions of students in California, so you're you're really looking at you know uh, I think in California there's 5,000 students, but still out of, out right. of millions, right? Okay. Okay. Uh, so the other the other interesting finding related to this is um, so NAEP they do all the states 
They also do a handful of big urban districts, about 25. And LA is one of those districts uh, that's included. And one of the big headline findings was um, LA was the only district that saw positive gains on NAEP. Everybody else went down. And LA stayed close the longest, right? So everybody's like scratching their heads. Um, the Wall Street Journal had a piece where they were like, oh, you know, you know, how did, did how did LA beat the odds? They talked to the superintendent. He said, oh, it was our amazing uh, attendance at online learning, uh, <laughs> yeah. et cetera. But so, but when you look at the, you know, when you look at the methodological notes, uh, there was a really important methodological change. So LA is a big district. It has a lot of charter schools and the charter schools are actually much higher performing than the public schools there. So in 2019, they did not include the charter schools in their sample. Oh. In 2022, they did. <laughs> so in some ways, you're getting you're changing the composition and you're including a lot more higher achieving students. And that artificially makes the LA, LA in 2022 look a lot better than it did in 2019. So that's the, uh, that's the LA story as well. It's really about composition and, and making sure that you're comparing apples to apples rather than apples to oranges. Now, um, what about these comparisons that I see David Wallace Wells and others make where they try to compare our test scores to the Netherlands and they say, look, you know, uh, the Netherlands, they reopened rapidly and they've also had a decline. We're not that much worse, even though we were closed for much longer. Any thoughts on this? Yeah, you know, I, I haven't followed that debate closely. And I think in particular, you know, the, the tests that we have are not necessarily on the same scale. So yes, I, it's hard for me to kind of fully understand exactly how, how it's done. I think it's much more useful to compare within the United States and compare um, across districts within the same state who are taking the same test. Um, and again, so we've done this in Ohio. Um, folks in North Carolina and their Department of Education have done this analysis. And, and um, just last week, at the end of last week, there is um, an organization um, at Stanford where they take all the state tests, and they're all different in every state, but they have a methodology where they convert them to the same scale. And so they put out data from, I think, about 30 states where you can compare at the district level the declines. Uh, and if you look you know, either across the whole country or within states, there's a lot of variation across districts. And you see a very striking pattern. The more in-person learning you had, the smaller the declines were. Now, everybody had declines. And I, I think I want to be clear about that, right? That everyone suffered, but the more in-person learning you had, the less you suffered. And you know, I, I don't think uh, virtual learning, at least during the 2020-21 school year, explains most of the COVID learning loss, right? But it does explain a pretty big chunk of it. So yes, like if everybody had reopened in fall of 2020, students would still be behind. They, but they wouldn't be behind as much as they are now. They would be behind considerably less, but they would still be behind. Can you quantify the percent of variation that's due to um, mode of instruction versus other factors? Uh, so, you know, I think uh, I think it's, it's it's more useful to think about like magnitude of the effects. Okay, uh, yes, and so, sure. Yeah, and so um, uh, I'm trying to remember, this is from the, uh, you know, taking the district level data and just regressing it on percent of the school year right. that, that, you, that you were in person and essentially... Um, uh, for every percentage point increase um, in uh, in in uh, in person learning, yeah, yes, uh, you know, test scores went up in, in reading; they went up in math about one and a half times as much. But if you take those estimates and you convert them to like, you know, of the total learning loss, what percent was due to the amount of virtual learning that different districts saw in the aggregate? So my ballpark estimate is, you know, like in in reading, about a third of the overall loss was the the virtual learning during the 2020-21 school year. And in math, it's about a quarter. Um, but again, that's, we're only talking about the 2020 21 school year. There's also obviously the school closures in the spring of 2020 right. that hit everybody. And that's probably an important part of the residual loss as well. I see. And um, I guess the reason you focus on that is that um, uh, it, it's, it's a modifiable factor. It was modifiable because you and I were shouting that they should reopen. I mean, there were people who said that they should reopen. And so it was a modifiable, lamentable factor. And that's what we're trying to quantify. Whereas in the spring of 2020, I don't think there were many people, except for Jennifer Nuzzo in the New York Times. She actually said in March of 2020, you know that op-ed? Um, no, no, no. March of 2020, New York Times op-ed, Jennifer Nuzzo for, from Johns Hopkins University said, uh, maybe we shouldn't close schools after all, but it was lost in a sea of anger. And uh, yeah. Well, you know who else said we shouldn't close schools? Bill de Blasio, the mayor of New York, if you remember that. That's right, that. yeah. Uh, and, then, and, then, and then you also went to the YMCA and got in a lot of trouble. But people that's forgot right. the, uh, the school piece. So you know, it turned out maybe that's the one policy area where de Blasio turned out to be, in retrospect, uh, you know, correct. When we talk about learning losses, some purists say that it's not like the kids lost knowledge. It's that they didn't gain as much. Uh, six of one, half dozen of the other. I mean, what, are, what, are, what do they mean by this? It's splitting hairs. I mean, the kids, they're not learning like they used to learn if they won the pandemic. And we didn't have closed schools. Is, is, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I think you know, I, I think like the debate over the terminology is kind of you know, it's kind of crazy. I, I think you know, I guess I get their point that students, it's not like they went backwards; they just didn't grow as much as they would have. Um, but yeah, I mean, the policy impact is the same, and I think unfortunately, often the people that 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 take that position are also the people that want to minimize the impacts and say, and, and also you know, defend defend the prolonged school closures. So I think those those often go together. Um, but I, you know, I'm fine ha- calling it uh, learning disruption. I think that's probably a more accurate term. But again, the 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 um, urgency of the issue is, is the same no matter what, right? Um, and and whether whatever you call it, we have to do something about it. It's again, especially for those older high school students. When I did pediatrics and uh, a parent felt like their child wasn't growing properly, um, they came in for a workup for like stunted growth. And there was this grave concern that they're not growing on the, nobody said that, well, he's still taller than he was when he was an infant. They, they didn't say that, they, you know, because you want to see growth, I think. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah. so exactly. anything else you want to say about NAEP or you want to move to other state assessments beyond this? Um. Yeah, let's, let's move on. Yeah. Okay. Um. So yeah, other state assessments complement these findings. Yes. So other state assessments complement these findings. And I mentioned that that Stanford and Harvard analysis, what they took did is they took all the available state assessment data um, and they uh, converted them to be on a common scale. And then helpfully, they also converted that scale to be the same as a NAEP scale. Right. So we have kind of we can take the state assessments and overlay them with a the NAEP and, and then really drill down because NAEP aside from those 25 districts, it's at the state level. It's like a couple of thousand students. Uh, the state assessments, right, it's it's 90, 95% of all students in all the districts. Yeah. And we can really dig down into the variation. Um, and, and I think it's much more granular and much more helpful, not only for figuring out the impact of uh, the pandemic, but also I think um, the recovery, uh, because we've also seen pretty uneven recovery. Uh, some places have grown more than others and also understand, well, what is it that they're doing that's helping students recover in a way that the NAEP data you just can't do? So... That's really interesting to me. Um, these these findings were big, and I saw a lot of downplaying. One of the people I saw downplaying it was uh, uh, the teachers' unions. Can you talk for a minute about any of these data sets? Have they explored unions, or is union and partisanship collinear? I mean, and being, you know, you're either Trump and you're not unionized, you know, or you're an urban district anti-Trump, pro-union. Um, can we tease apart the Trump and the union? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. So you're right; it's very hard to do empirically um, because yeah, the the places that stay closed are big urban districts. The places that have the strongest teachers unions are the big urban districts. Now, so what we have, I think, the best we have is some case studies, and there's a nice paper by by some folks at Wayne State that interviewed district officials, um, and you know they made very clear that like the you know the union uh, union opposition was a big hurdle, particularly in states where you have collective bargaining, mm-hmm. where you really the unions have veto power, right? Um, and I think you saw this in San Francisco. Uh, that, that was one of the districts where the union said, you know, we have specific demands. One of them is uh, toilet seat covers. Until you give us toilet seat covers, we're not signing this. Right. And they can do that in, 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 the, in those states. Right. Um, so, <laughs> so there, you know, there are anecdotes like that. I, I'll tell you another anecdote. So I, I was on a panel last Friday with a, a former superintendent. I won't mention what, which, which superintendent, but it was from a, one of the largest districts in the country. It was one of the districts that uh, was also reopened late. And we were talking, uh, and then after the event was over, uh, he turned to me and he said, you know, I, I really wanted to reopen, but the, the teacher's union wouldn't let me. And when I decided I was going to reopen, open, reopen anyway, they went to the mayor and they're trying to get the mayor to push me not to reopen. And so I think there are clear anecdotes like that in, in um, you know, in San Francisco, um, in Detroit, in Chicago. I'll give you another example here in Columbus. Um, we were, again, another district that, that stayed closed for a while. Uh, they, they brought in the county public health director in October of 2020. She said... I think students need to be back at school. I think it's safe. And the district said, all right, we're reopening. We're going to bring in the highest risk risk students. We're going to bring in the special ed students who can't do Zoom. And we're going to bring our career tech students. So students who are learning welding and who are learning to be dental assistants. You can't learn on Zoom, right? Right. Um, And so they announced this. They told the parents, you know, we're bringing these these students back. And then the teachers union said, "Uh, you haven't bargained with us. um, And we're not going to agree. And so they didn't. And they they had to roll back their reopening saying, we apologize, but the teachers union sign off. And we stayed closed for another three months after that until the governor really forced her hand. So I think there are very clear anecdotes like that where it's not in the data, it's hard to measure, but I think it's very clear that particularly in places where, um, you know, the collective bargaining laws give teachers unions veto power, um, they use that veto power to really drag this process out, which is, yeah, I think not necessarily an indictment of teachers unions in general. I think, you know, as I always say, sometimes the interests of teachers and students are aligned. I think this is one case where they were not. And I think we've now seen the consequences of that misalignment. 
Yeah, that's that's well put. Um, and for listeners who may not remember, there was a prominent Twitter account that said something like, if you don't put the toilet seat down when you flush, you can aerosolize COVID. And this kind of crazy fear mongering led to literally the demand to have, you know, a ceiling toilet seat when you would flush, um, which obviously, I don't know if people know this, but that wasn't a major driver of COVID spread. <laughs> Fecal aerosol wasn't, uh, spoiler alert, wasn't. And the point about the unions... I think it's true. I think that's been, you know, I was doing a lot of work behind the scenes with people and meeting and trying to get people to see the light. Um, and I found that there were there were several big barriers. The biggest barrier, I think, in all honesty, was Anthony Fauci. Not Anthony Fauci, the man, but Anthony Fauci and the rhetoric. Um, he had the pulpit. He was St. Anthony of Fauci, you know, and his rhetoric on schools was extremely pessimistic. Um, there were lots of other people who were, quote, now they define themselves as I was always for reopening. Yeah, I remember you. You were for reopening when cases were less than five per 100,000 over the course of a week, which, by the way, it was never going to be. So you were essentially for them being closed because yeah. you set an impossible threshold. Or you were for reopening when the university or the school would invest in a $1 million HEPA filter in every classroom. Well, guess what? Uh, they're never going to do that. And the irony I still see from all these people was, Right now, vaccination rates in many of these age groups in the adolescence is what, 40, 50, 60 percent. But in five to 11, it's still 30 percent. And in under five, it's five percent. And 86 percent have had COVID anyway. So what was all this for? It wasn't for the children. You could make the argument as for the parents and the older people in their house. But, you know, we, we all know the there are empirical analyses of that. And it showed, you know, very little community spread was changed with closing of the schools. Um, because a lot of people were getting COVID because they were meeting up, um, you know, going, you know, from work, from meeting people. And that wasn't school mediated. Um, let's get to the, the fun part of your yeah, talk. Let, let me just jump yeah, in no, really go on, fast. Go on. Yes. I, I, yeah. And that last point. So, uh, you know, what was interesting is, um, you know, what was the rhetoric that was used? I think yes. this, this speaks to you and you, you think, you, you know, your, your views that was Fauci. So, um, the, the paper I mentioned where they interviewed school districts, there's a very interesting finding that comes out of that, which was that districts that want to stay closed would point to the CDC guidance and say, look, my hands are tied. Uh, I'm just doing what the CDC tells me to do. And in many communities, they talked to uh, to the districts and the union leaders. And also that was a big talking point in the negotiations where the, you know, the teachers union would point to the CDC and says, look, the CDC says we need X, Y, and Z. Um, and, and I say this because I think um, if you recall when, uh, when Joe Biden was sworn in and uh, Walensky became the CDC director in February of 2021, they put out the CDC guidance about school reopening. Um, and if you recall, you and I wrote a piece saying like, this is yeah. crazy. Like they, they are putting these crazy conditions. And the point we made, and I think this was a quote, we said they're providing political cover for districts that want to stay closed. Right. And I think the interview data 100% confirms that, that they really did provide cover um, for districts that, that were reluctant to reopen and also for talking points for their uh, labor partners who were you know trying to find good talking points to justify staying, staying closed. It was particularly bad because my sources tell me that Walensky was active in Brookline, Massachusetts prior to that, and she was actually vocally for school reopening. Um, and so it's amazing how the gears of politics can grind you down. But let's talk a little bit about, first, let's talk about what your agenda um, is, which is that, you know, uh, the, the, the carton of eggs has been knocked to the floor and the eggs are cracked and leaking. What can we do now? I mean, what are your policy preferences going forward? If you could have the ear of the policymaker, what do we need to take seriously? What do we need to do going forward? And then we can talk about my favorite issue. Let's relitigate the past. <laughs> All right. Yeah, my sounds favorite. great. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I have, I have like very strong feelings about this. Uh, and so I think there's um, three things that are non-negotiables for me. So one, when you're thinking about the magnitude of the learning disruption, again, we won't use learning loss, but learning disruption, I think we have to ask, like, have we ever in the past found an intervention that can at scale, at scale, I'm not talking about like a pilot study with 40 students, but at scale, provide this much growth in a short period of time? No. And the answer is, like, for the most part, no, but there is one intervention that comes close, and that is extended learning time. That means longer school days. Yeah. That okay. means longer school years. Yeah. And that is the one intervention that literally no one is doing. No one is doing. Um, the LA superintendent tried to add like a couple of days and the teachers unions balked at it. Now, a lot of the opposition, again, is coming from teachers unions. Uh, you know, I think understandably, it's been pretty hard being a teacher. They don't want to work longer. Um, but also, it, it, surprisingly, many parents are also not that excited about changing their summer plans. I think partly because they don't fully understand how far behind their students are. But so if there's one magical thing we could do, 
and, and I'm not the only person that says this. So Thomas Kane, who's a, an economist at Harvard, wrote a piece in the Atlantic a few months ago saying like, if we were serious, the only way to fix this is more learning time and no one is doing it and we're still not doing it. So that's, I think, point one. I think point two is uh, at the very least, we need to like stop screwing things up more and we actually need to get schools functioning and in many communities, they're not. And I think there's two big barriers right now. One is transportation. Um, many schools that closed, uh, uh, they either laid off their drivers or those drivers found jobs driving for Amazon. And when schools reopened, uh, they didn't come back because Amazon turned out to be, you know, pay, pay better. You didn't have to deal with 40 screaming kids in the back. You didn't have to start working at 4.40 a.m., right? <laughs> um, so that is, a, I mean, that is, I think, such an underappreciated challenge. And in many communities like ours, I mean, we have thousands of students who are not going to school because they don't have transportation that the district is required to provide. And again, you know, I think they're working really hard. They have literally they have people coming in, driving in the morning, then after driving, coming in and trying to do routing, coming in on Saturdays to do routing. But there's a bus driver shortage, and we we have not figured out a way to do that. So some some uh, some states uh, drafted the um, the their um, uh, National Guard to drive school buses. And I think it is at that level of an emergency where we should consider that because again, if the kids are not getting to school, they're not going to make up these learning losses. I think the other issue that we've seen, um, and I think this is a self-inflicted wound, which is is teacher shortages. Some of that is substitute teachers. Um, again, the economy has been hot, and substitute teaching doesn't pay that well. And particularly last year during Omicron, when you have many teachers out, many schools shut down just because they didn't have teachers. And we're seeing on a more limited uh, basis the same happening this year. Um, but also we are seeing teacher shortages. But it's not, the, I think, not the problem that many people think. So there was a lot of talk early in the pandemic that uh, teachers are going to resign and, and huge numbers. And certainly some of the surveys that were done of teachers showed that teachers were stressed and uh, playing. But when you look at actually the administrative data, the payroll data, it didn't happen. Most of the people who said they were going to leave didn't leave. Um, so, so teacher workforces did not shrink dramatically. But instead, what districts got was uh, over $100 billion of federal money that had to be spent within three years. And the fastest way to spend money is to just hire more people. And so we've seen a huge ramp up in new hiring. And so now, because teacher supply is relatively fixed in the short term, right? It's not like there's a truckload of teachers sitting on the sidelines waiting for a job. Um, now we've seen this kind of mad rush to hire more. And so you have districts hiring each other's teachers, uh, you know, picking away as teachers, driving up salaries. So in the long run, it's going to create some financial challenges, but also leaving the hardest to staff schools, the most disadvantaged students, uh, most heavily affected because, mm. uh, you know, teachers, when they have the choice, they would rather teach at a wealthy suburban school with white students than to teach at an urban low-income school with non-white students. And so it's those districts and those schools in particular that are suffering, I think, um, because of this, I think, essentially self-inflicted wound of, of this federal money chasing chasing a uh, limited number of teachers. And That's until we have, again, until we get kids to school on a bus and until we have a licensed adult in front of the classroom, like there's nothing we can do. And we're not doing either of those things in many places. And it's just shocking, I think, how little people understand, um, you know, just just the toll that this is continuing to take. So we're not we're not, you know, making up lost ground. We are continuously, I think, still falling further behind uh, in many ways. What are the minimum requirements to be a teacher? Is there an opportunity to improve the teacher supply by waiving some of these licensure things? Yeah, you know, it, it varies a lot across states. And I think you saw Ron DeSantis in uh, in Florida got got some heat right when he said. Basically, uh, you know, if you're in the armed forces, we're going to hire you. You don't need a teacher credential. And of course, you know, the teachers and the teaching uh, teacher unions and the, some of the licensing programs said this is outrageous. Um, and, and, you know, there's been a lot of debate even before the pandemic about, you know, uh, are the formal requirements we require of teachers, are they actually necessary? Do they make better teachers or do they keep um, people, particularly uh, second career people and also particular people of color out of the profession? And I think, you know, the evidence is not not clear that all the hurdles we have to teaching are that important. Uh, it seems like we could really increase the pipeline, um, at least, you know, at least temporarily. Um, I think the other place where we have seen a lot more um, flex is on substitute teaching. So it used to be the case in many places that you had to have a college degree to be a substitute. And many states have have now kind of rolled it back and, and have allowed uh, allowed districts to hire people with lower levels of educational attainment. But um, again, substitute teacher pay is not great. Uh, many places you don't get any benefits and it's been a hot labor market. So, um, you know, it's not obvious that there is a huge, uh, huge number of people who, who even, you know, with the relaxed standards are, are rushing to go teach in schools at subs. So I think it's still very much a problem.
I like all your suggestions. And uh, the suggestion I most like is that, uh, I mean, if I was a politician running for office, I think I would run on the platform of extended school year. I think it's 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 long been time to eliminate the summer vacation. That's it's it's no longer it it makes no it has no relevance in the modern world. We're not an agrarian economy, and you know, and and we don't need the summers off to go help out in the fields at home. And what we are is uh, a nation that I think is like increasingly divided and poorly educated, and we need to work on that. And to some degree, I think I would pay people more uh, to work more uh, if that's what it takes. But to some degree. You know, I'm always struck by like the lack of any sense of duty in society anymore. Um, and this is my soapbox, which is that every single year I've been faculty, I do I do doctor work that I quote don't have to do or is unpaid because there's like extra shifts, and they're like, does somebody want to volunteer for this for nothing? And I'll do it. Why? Because that's like life, you know? That's what you're supposed to do. You have a skill, and if you know how to do it, and people need you, you do it. And I feel little sympathy, I guess, for a lot of people in the modern world. Uh, uh, not to, it's not unique to teachers. Half these young people who tell me they want to retire when they're 30 or, you know, not use a skill or talent I have no sympathy for. Uh, because I think we've lost a sense of, like, you got to go do your job. And then my other solution would be... Um, you know, I've always been saying we need a one year uh, public service commitment for everyone when they're 17 or 18. And that will include you're going to be recruited to go help out at schools. Either you drive that bus or you teach or you do something to help out. Um, and I think you my solution has two goals. One is to get people to do something communal. And two is I'm going to prick people from Kansas, Kentucky, and Chicago, and Los Angeles so that people can learn that despite political differences, there's a lot more they have in common. And so maybe bridge some of these horrific political divides I keep seeing. Yeah, so so let me just jump in. I mean, I guess I'm gonna I'm gonna be uh, less less uh, cool than you. I, yeah. I have a, I have a reputation on Twitter for being a teacher hater, but actually I think <laughs> we, they gotta pay teachers more. Come on, if you want to okay. have them work more, I, and, and the districts have the money, right? We got a hundred billion dollars, so they can afford it. And I, I don't think we can expect people to work more for the same amount of money. I really don't, given the the pay rate for many teachers. Now, your second point, I love, and we actually have a great example of this called Teach for America. Teach for America is exactly your model, right? You get, yeah, it is. Uh, and it's very selective. You get students, uh, the highest achieving college students, the most motivated, and it's a two-year commitment. And here's what I love about it. So, um, you know, again, th their training is pretty minimal, but they are pretty motivated. So there's been some really good evaluations, and it suggests that Teach for America teachers are at least as good as the licensed teachers in the schools where they work. But here's the other piece of it. And so there's a really cool paper by a political scientist uh, at UC Berkeley. So Teach for America introduced the scoring system where if you wanted to be Teach for America, you, you had to cross a certain numerical threshold. You got accepted. And so as a methodologist, you, you should immediately think, right, that's a great discontinuity. And it's like a great way to estimate causal effects of right. being a Teach for America teacher. And so they go back five years later and they compare teachers who got accepted barely to applicants who barely didn't get accepted. And what we see is not only do the kids benefit from Teach for America because their teachers are pretty good, but it has a profound political impact on the attitudes of the people who became Teach for America teachers. They, they were much more likely to, uh, to, you know, to think there's a lot of injustice in the world. They were much more uh, empathetic to like a lot of these problems. They were much more likely to be concerned about racism. Uh, and they had very different attitudes on educational policy. And they were much more motivated to help close achievement gaps. And so I think your service program, not only would it fill the short term need for teachers, but I think politically, right, it would be it would be um, invaluable, right, for, for really helping people understand uh, what's going on outside of their communities. And really, I think in a very productive way, move us towards a more consensus on a lot of these issues. That's really well said. Yeah, it's really it's easy to be indifferent to something if you've never seen it. And so I think that's also why, you know, those of us who work in county hospitals, uh, who work in, you know, underserved communities like you, you are naturally sympathetic. Um, uh, it, you become sympathetic to a lot of these challenges with insurance, et cetera. Now, let's litigate a little bit of the past. I see a lot of people say in this space of school closure, let's not play the blame game. Let's just solve the problem. Let's not get into who was at fault. And, you know, imagine if Donald Trump said that about January 6th. Oh, let's just solve the problem, but let's not actually try to point fingers at who was responsible for January 6th. We would say, no, you got to point the finger at who was, you know, who was responsible. Similarly, you have to point the finger insofar as pointing the finger will lead to changes in behavior. And from my standpoint, I would say that um, it, it didn't help that you had a very divisive president in uh, an unprecedented pandemic. Uh, 
Um, it, it, it could have been better if it wasn't election year. So not only was a divisive president and an election year, that and COVID, and it's really the three. Uh, maybe I'll add one more factor, the rise of big technology. Because if it weren't for big technology, we wouldn't have been wedded to this particular response. But, um, you know, progressives often think of ourselves as like, we're the smarter ones. You know, we're the ones that are supposed to be, I mean, I think that's an attitude in the progressive community. Um, but they really revealed that they're just as tribal and political as anyone else on the schools issue. Because from a progressive standpoint, in my mind, progressives, like the goal of progressivism is that our goal is to realize that, you know, life's never going to be perfect equal outcomes, but at least it can be equal opportunity. And one of the few tattered rope ladders we still have left is public schools. Um, we could be building more ladders of opportunity. That's what we should be doing as progressives. We certainly shouldn't be cutting down the one ladder we have. But it was very clear in the early pandemic that there was going to be differences. Anyone who was rich was putting their kids in pods or private tutors or moving their kids to private schools that were willing to stay open. The private schools that stayed open, they had elaborate, like, all the kids spit in a bucket and we tested for PCR. I'm not sure that actually did anything to slow the spread of COVID rather than just some theater that made them all feel better about what they were doing. But it was clear that public school kids were not getting any of this. They're not getting any of these advantages and that these gaps were going to widen. Most of the progressives who were speaking out about it on social media they would say things like, they would literally say, Vlad, my kids are doing fine. I still have the tweets. I got the, I got the receipts. I was like, you're a fucking professor. Hey, you're, you're worth a million dollars. What are you talking about? You're, of course your kids are going to be fine. You're rich. You're rich and you're well-connected, of course. And you're also highly educated. That's not the kids that we're ever worried about, your kids. No one's worried about your kids except you. And you're worried about whether they go to Harvard or UC Berkeley. That's the extent of your worries. We're worried about the kids who are like, it's the only chance forward. Um... So I do fault like a lack of empathy. The lack of empathy was, you know, fueled also by the distance and in person and like, you know, we're all cut off from each other. Um, and then I do fault, I think a lot of fault has to go with Anthony Fauci. Um, you know, I, 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 and people aren't gonna be happy with me for saying this, but he displays so many hallmarks of just abject narcissism in my opinion, which is one, he won't relinquish his title, his role, even at the age of 80. He's so, he wants to be the head of an agency for decade after decade. I don't think that's normal. And then when the crisis hit, you know, I mean, the emails do show that they really did try to stifle out people who said anything against them. And I always say this about Jay and Martin. Um, I didn't sign the GBD. And I, it, and I didn't sign it mostly because it didn't have in it what I wanted to see, which was, yes, we should do targeted protection, but here are all the programs we should fund. Because I'm a progressive. I like to fund things. It should have had that, and then I would have had my signature. Um, but whatever you think about them, that article was more right about schools than anyone else in the whole pandemic, that that wasn't the place you should be uh, focused on. And even John, whatever you think about John and his IFR, he was more right about schools than anyone. And... In, me, in my mind, one of the tragedies was not only was the rhetoric one way, they wouldn't even have the debate. I mean, Harvard had zero debates. Stanford had zero debates. I mean, they made Emily Oster like she was the boogeyman. I mean, Emily Oster, she writes parenting books. She's not the boogeyman. Um, and, and then the unions, I think, if I were the unions, my political advice is always they got to smell which way the wind is blowing. They need to throw someone under the bus. Like, they're coming for you, unions. There's going to be a campaign to privatize schools, and it's going to be successful. I mean, a lot of it will be successful. And some of it might not even be good, but it'll be successful. The only way to save what little tattered bit you have left is start throwing him people on the bus. Say, Fauci met with us on this day, and he said this, and so-and-so met with us on this day, and they said this, and that was why we were so scared for ourselves. We didn't have the facts, you know? Just throw them under the bus. Otherwise, they're coming for you. Uh, okay, that's my rant. Yeah. Your thoughts? Yeah, so yeah, sure. So let me start with the last one. I think you're yes. absolutely right in that, uh, you know, I think everybody uses a crisis as an opportunity. And I think what you've seen in many red states is exactly what you described. So Arizona passed this backpack funding bill where now you could take the money that would have gone to the local schools and you can take it with you to a private school, to a pod, to a homeschool. Um, and, and they're exactly using the kind of rhetoric that you're talking about. So, you know, I don't know how helpful it is to like, you know, really to get the past, but I'm with you 100 percent. on like, we have to learn the lessons so we don't repeat them. And I think there are three lessons uh, that, that I think all of us should take away from all this. One is exactly as you described, um, during a period of high polarization, um, it's not necessarily helpful for the president to weigh in on these kinds of issues, right? 
Hmm. Uh, Interesting. You're not okay. being a leader when you're pissing off half the country and mobilizing them against you. And we saw it with the school closures. I think now we're seeing the same kind of stuff with like CRT debates. So I think we, you know, on many of these issues, we actually need less national leadership because I think in many ways it, it, it polarizes and politicizes these issues in ways that in the absence of Trump weighing in, maybe the school closure debate would have played out very differently. So I think that's one important lesson, right? Like that. Okay, but that, um, you got to pair yeah. that with one thing, which is that if you're yeah. a professor at a university and the polarizing figure says something, you, you have to be smart enough to not let it just, oh, oh, he said it, so screw it. You know, you have to have some no, brain power. Yeah. Okay, okay, all right. The, but, but you know, two, I think yeah, what's, no, here's, you're right. here's what's yeah. interesting about that. Um, there's research going back decades, and it shows that yeah. the more highly educated you are, uh, the more you are likely to respond in like this polarizing way because you are sophisticated enough to like understand like the you know understand the arguments and understand like the the nuance and understand also like the partisan um, you know the partisan cues and it's actually people who are less educated who are least responsive and least polarized along these lines so it's kind of ironic because it is really, really people at, at you know in the universities who are most likely to kind of go along with their team um, and that's but, but do you do you feel yeah. like Okay, so I personally, I know because my views span many teams, like it doesn't, I, I mean, I feel as if it doesn't affect me one bit. Every time I hear an issue and I hear what people are saying, even my love, you know, my team and their team, and I, you know, even, I always say, okay, all right, then I dig into it a little bit. And sometimes I agree with them, my team, but sometimes I throw them under the bus. How do you feel? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's hard. I think that domains where we are probably experts, I think we, we, we probably do that, but yes. who knows, you know? Um, you don't know what you don't know, right? You don't know what your blind spots are. But let me talk about the okay, other Okay, 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 yeah. go on. Go on. Yeah. So I think one is like, I, I think, you know, um, we, I think we have to realize that the interests of adults are not always aligned with the interests of children. And I think <clears> particularly <throat> the interests of adult employees, right? And so if, if the pandemic taught us anything, it's that like when the teachers union says this is bad, it could be bad or maybe it's not so bad. So we really, I think, uh, have to, I think, think really critically. And I would say, again, the debates about school, uh, school hours, school years, I think is one area where this is playing out, where teachers unions and places like L.A. are really using their political clout to block uh, block these kind of remediation efforts. Um, and so I think clearly people did not did not learn that lesson. And public opinion doesn't show any decline in trust in teachers unions. And related so to that is say, if oh, wait, related to that, if yeah. you give money. How do you know the money you're giving is going to the kids and not to the, you know, secondary interests? Oh, man. I mean, that's such a, such a good question. So, so let me just kind of do a quick tangent okay, on this. Okay, so okay, yeah, the American Rescue Plan, that's like, you know, tens of billions of dollars. Only 20% has to be set aside for learning loss. Only 20%, which means 80% could go on anything. But it's even worse than that because, they're, you know, money is fungible. So imagine yeah. that last year you had a summer school program yeah. and you paid for it out of your local property tax dollars. This year you have the same program. You haven't added a single seat, yeah, but now yeah. you charge it to the American Rescue Plan, right. and it's all learning loss recovery dollars. But it's not any new programming, right. and so the accounting, uh, the accounting safeguards are are trash. We have no idea what the money is being spent on. We have no idea how money is being changed for other money, and we have no idea what's going towards. So I think it's it's going to be, uh, you know, a scandal once this data eventually does come out. Uh, okay, but but Number let me three. add with the last lesson yet, yeah, which is that. Uh, you know, the decisions that we made, again, I'm not, I don't want to blame people, but the decisions that we made will have consequences. It will have consequences for the kids, but it will also have consequences, consequences for the education system. What we've seen in many communities is huge decline in enrollments. And what that's going to mean is school closures, right? There's no way that you can run a school system with five to 10% fewer students with the same number of schools, because you're just spending a lot of money on janitors and librarians and cafeteria workers on a half empty building. And that means that's not money that you can spend on kids. And what we know from the past is those debates are incredibly politically toxic. They are very divisive because it's often minority neighborhoods where the schools close um, and, and they become very, very polarized. But we have to remember, like, we did this, right? And that's the natural consequence. And we're gonna have to make those tough decisions, right? It's not some neoliberal conspiracy to defund public schools. It's the fact that the decisions we made caused school enrollments to plummet, particularly in urban areas. And that is going to necessitate very, very painful things like school closures. Um, and I think we have to remember what, what started this. And it was our decisions, our collective decisions. And we have to you know, accept that. Yeah, that's really well put. I have three things to add to your pile. One, anytime you have unprecedented challenges and unprecedented policy, you have to have public debates of intellectuals. You can't say, they're the fringe epidemiologists or whatever. You have to have the debate. And I think it's like 
people talk about misinformation. How do you know? You've never, you've never done this in the history of society. It's, misinf- it's suddenly misinformation to do it or not do it. I mean, you could argue it either way, but I, th- I think that has to take place. Two, I think there's got to be more firewalls between people who are tasked with the public service and politics. And I think that's true in FDA, where like, and the CDC, the fact the CDC director is at the beck and call of the president is crazy. You need the, there needs to be firewall, like they, and they need to have a term that might span maybe five year terms or something, uh, maybe like the Federal Reserve chair, you know, uh, or the FBI director span a couple presidents, um, not always be political, not always have to go report to the boss and have some freedom. Um, and three, I think all of these issues, well, uh, um, maybe built into two, you need to have like different people, different opinions at your table. And three, I think experimentation. So I guess I don't know the answer to schools, but I would imagine that if I were the education secretary, you need to start running a lot of studies right now. Like we're going to try this here and this there, natural experiments, randomized studies, quasi-randomized studies, step wedge design, roll it out differently. But we got to take our money and think about how to use it wisely and efficiently. And and it is going to take a lot of money. Um, but I, I really worry that if we don't do it, we're doomed. I, I agree with you. I mean, you and I have always been on the same page in terms of methods. I think like yeah. having bad, bad data, bad research design uh, is is worse than having no data at all, right? Because yeah. you, you, the wrong answer is not better than no answer, right? Correct. And so I completely agree with you that we need much more careful um, quality control for the kind of evidence we use to make policy. Now, on your first point, you know, I, I agree about debates. I guess I will add a, a kind of a counter argument or a counter a flip side. I think we have to have debates in good faith, right? I think we have to have some norms that are internalized where like. You know, you, you don't argue things just to argue them, right? You argue them because you think they're right, and you think, uh, and, and and you also have to be willing to change your mind. Because I think often, oftentimes, you know, those kind of debates, you know, they don't lead anywhere, right? People argue and debate, and then you, you know, like you walk away as an audience, like not really sure what the what the right, the right answer is. And there's people that are willing to to go to the map for an idea, not just because they believe in it, but because, right? It's 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 in. You know, it supports their side, it supports their political party, et cetera. So I do think we have to be also, you know, I think we have to be, um, again, I think make a debate in good faith and, and yeah. our, you know, not 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 debate just for the sake of de- debating to, to try to push our preferred policy agenda. I like that. And I think a, a, and a nice compromise there is sometimes you get both debaters to agree on what is the study that will help you, that will decide who's the winner. Will you two agree on the study design? We'll run that study and we'll see who's the winner. So if the policy was, for instance, masking toddlers, and we could agree on a cluster RCT, you're pro-toddler masking, for instance, and I'm an anti-toddler masker, uh, you know, uh, that would be useful. You're right. I think that's important. And that's the problem with politics, um, is that it makes those kinds of debates very difficult. Um, the last thing I was going to say about schools was, um, um, it's escaping me while I went on my rant. Um, uh, I think the, the other side of the ledger we didn't talk enough about but you and I talked about it in, even in January 2021, is what did we gain from the closure? I mean, what was the gain? And I think people are taking for granted that we gained something. I'm not sure we gained anything. Uh, I guess, to, in my mind, the, you know, the Chris Whaley paper, the paper on community spread based on schools being open and closed, I mean, I think their point estimate was something like 0.7 cases per 10,000 people, and I forget the unit time, per week, um, by having open versus closed schools in that whole community. In other words, what am I saying? Uh, Chris Whaley and Niraj Sood from the University of Southern California, they have a regression model. And the model is saying, how many more cases of COVID would you have had had you had open versus closed schools? And they're trying to get a numerical estimate for that. And the estimate they got was something like one case per 10,000 people in a community over the course of a week if the school system was open, then where it closed, which... Many people will argue with, but it was a small effect, even in their own paper, as community cases went, you know, for anything from, I don't know, you know, zero cases to like 150 cases per 100,000, per 10,000 per week or something. Um, it was modest. Agree? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I remember that paper. It's a really well done paper. Now, yeah. some might say, it, again, it's a it's a it's a uh, lower bound because the really the, the causal estimate came from comparing families with kids. Yes. To families without, without kids. kids right? yes. And it was a difference between those two. And to the extent that there's spillovers, that a parent with kids goes to work and gets their kid-free coworker sick, right? That's going to potentially contaminate the control group. But I think you're right that the point estimate was, was, you know, across all these studies in general was pretty small. I think Texas, there was one paper that said, like, 
Um, school closures accounted for like 70% of all the deaths in Texas, uh, school openings accounted yes. for 70% of the deaths. That, that wasn't plausible. But, you know, I guess, you know, I, I'm of two minds, I think like in retrospect versus at the time. And remember at the time, everyone was saying exponential spread, right? A small, small number that compounds over time forever. That's like, it could be everybody. And so what was small, I really, I think was sensitive to the modeling that you used, right? And and the dynamics that you assumed. And and, and I could come up with a, some sort of exponential model where even small amount, small amounts of community spread over the course of a school year could, again, under certain assumptions, lead to big numbers. So, you know, I guess I'll throw it out there. Uh, I think in retrospect, we know it's crazy. We know that the pandemic, right, went up and went down. Yeah, and there's all this cyclicality. Waves. Yeah. Right. Um, and so I think in retrospect, absolutely. Like, I think it's clear. And I think I think it's okay to say that, that, hey, like at the time, um, you know, it, it was a reasonable position. Uh, but in retrospect, I realized that that was probably the wrong position. I think that's kind of, I think, where I am, at least with spring of 2020. At the time, I thought we had to close schools. And now I look back and say, yep, yeah, yeah, like I was wrong. Um, and, and I think more of us should be able to do that. And again, well, our... our our reputation, I, I guess, not, it's not part of who we are. It's like it's okay to be wrong, you know. It's it's high uncertainty. I I was wrong. I mean, I was okay with closure in March 2020. I was wrong. Um, okay. Uh, by fall, I was not okay with it. Okay, and I was right. <laughs> and you were not okay by fall. But here's here's the moment where everyone should have not been okay with it. Spring 2021. I mean, you vaccinated the vulnerable. What the hell are you doing continuing to keep close? I mean, even the argument about spread is is null and void. Um, thoughts? Yeah, no, 100%. I think that's exactly right. Um, and and it, we did see public opinion, I think, pretty quickly, I think, con converge to that opinion. Uh, and, but, uh, again, I think San Francisco is, is you know, probably the, the stands out, right, where, I mean, they stayed closed no matter what, right? And, uh, you know, I mean, it was, it was outrageous, right? I mean, you had... The state said you have to reopen high school to get the state funding. So they brought the kids back for like one day, right? At the end of the year, right. just to get the state funding or something like that, right? Yeah. So I, I agree. I think the longer this dragged on, the less tenable that position becomes. And certainly once the vulnerable were vaccinated, certainly once the children are vaccinated, at least give parents the option. Like, fine, if some parents are scared, like, don't make them come back, but certainly give them the option. And the fact that the districts that didn't do that, I mean, again, I, I agree. At, at that time, there's just no way to rationalize that. I mean, that's just outrageous policy. Vlad Kogan, we've covered a lot of ground. And to summarize for the readers, I think you've taken us through nicely um, associations around which districts decided to reopen in the fall of 2020 in Ohio data, um, links between reopening and um, being of a minority race and uh, socioeconomic status in Ohio, links between uh, mode of education and out and uh, educational outcomes in Ohio. And then you took us through this national data set where we see rather starkly huge 20 year learning losses. Um, for people say that's no big deal. You make two excellent counterpoints. One, it took you billions of dollars uh, to achieve those gains. And two, if it's no big deal, then the loss of five years of life expectancy is no big deal because it's back to 1990 levels anyway. Uh, but it is a big deal. Both are big deals. Um, uh, although, to be honest, I actually, even the life expectancy is uh you know the way they actually calculated it if anything that's not as it's it's more overstated than these educational gains because it extrapolates that we're living forever in 2021 for the mm -hmm. rest of our lives like a groundhog's day of hell um then you've taken us through i think some of the local politics and your solutions i think are eminently reasonable and what any policymaker should should aspire to and i do think it we should be treating it as an emergency i mean i think that's part of it too is that this is an emergency. It's a crisis. People should run on it like it's a crisis. Um, I don't hear that rhetoric from either side. Um, Stat had an article about how a lot of Republicans are, I don't know if you saw this, it just came out yesterday. It was like a lot of Republicans are running on the platform that science overreached in the pandemic and it affected your lives in too many ways. And then the article, of course, by a liberal is very dismissive that this is crazy talk. But I disagree. I think that that, that they should run on that platform because that's a winning platform because a lot of people feel like they overreached and and the big and why do people feel like they overreached i don't think it was as much the bars i think it was the school and watching their own kids get thrown out of school for you know 18 months trying to piece together child care i think for a lot of people it broke them and there's a whole movement of people who i think switch teams as a result of this one issue this is their one issue um any closing thoughts on the school's issue what did we no, I think you're right. And I think, you, again, your home city of San Francisco is a great example. We had the entire school board, basically, where at least the majority of the school board recalled, right? Uh, 
uh, partly yeah. in response to dissatisfaction, right? And, and this is, yeah, this is San Francisco. Um, they so were too I, I busy right. changing the name of schools. Abraham Lincoln right, was, exactly. he wasn't good yep. enough. He wasn't good enough yeah, for them, yeah, yeah. obviously. What but did I he do? I think, you're, yeah, I think you're right that like, that I, the rhetoric is not helpful, right? You have Democrats saying, there's nothing to see here, move along. Uh, let's talk about Ukraine. And then you have Republicans <laughs> saying, let's talk about critical race theory. Let's talk about school choice. No one is talking about how are we going to get these kids back on track? And I, I love right. school choice. I'm all for it. But most students are going to be attending public schools, and we don't have a plan for how to get them back on track 100%. That's the most important thing. Um, it almost needs like a military effort, like a Marshall Plan for our own country. Absolutely, yeah. Vlad Kogan, thank you so much for doing this. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for having me.